you might actually write an equation like this. Okay? So the problem with this method is that we don't know what this relationship should be. Of course, if we knew what that relationship should be, then we would not use empirical equations. That's the first problem we need to solve. Is that what is the relationship? What is the correct relationship? We need a method where we don't need to assume the relationship, but the relationship is discovered. The second problem is that our brain seems to think very linearly, because look, I've got many, many plus signs here, okay? Even though this is slightly non-linear, everywhere I've got plus signs. And there's nothing in nature which says that things should be linear. And the third problem is that once I have derived this equation, it applies everywhere, the same relationship. So if I go from a steel to cast iron, then the effect of carbon is exactly the same. And that is not satisfactory because the behavior of carbon in cast iron is completely different from the behavior of carbon in steel. I need to be able to have different relationships in different parts of the input space. Okay? And this is, this is where neural networks comes in. And the way I'm going to demonstrate this to you is first I'm going to express this equation, this linear regression equation, in neural network terminology. Okay. So, this is that equation where I have the carbon, the manganese, the silicon, okay. and this is the yield strength. And in neural network terminology, we call this the input layer, because those are the input variables. And this is the output layer, this is the yield strength. And I take the carbon, I multiply it by a random number. Okay. I take the manganese, I multiply it by another random number. And the silicon multiplied by another number, random number, add them all up. And that calculation is done in what's known as a hidden layer. And I get the answer for the yield strength, which is not going to be correct, because I've used random numbers here. Okay. But I have experimental value. So I go back and I modify these numbers until I get fitting. And that's exactly what we do in a linear regression equation. So we haven't made any advance, but this is a neural network representation of that linear regression equation. Okay. Uh, this is the same slide. Uh, toughness here, we are multiplying by random numbers, adding up, comparing with experiments, modifying the coefficients and we get a linear regression equation for toughness. But the diagram is a neural network representation of linear regression. So we haven't solved any problem as yet. Yeah. First of all, we need to make this a bit more non-linear. And we do that by, by taking the carbon, multiplying it by this coefficient, and taking the hyperbolic tangent of that product. Right. Now the hyperbolic tangent looks like this. Okay. And if I change the value of, of this coefficient, sorry, I've, I've gone forward too quickly. Yeah. If, I, if I take the value of this coefficient and I change it, then the hyperbolic tangent can be gentle or it can almost be linear. So the reason why we use the hyperbolic tangent is first of all it's non-linear, okay? And secondly, it's a very flexible function that by altering the coefficient I can make it gentle or almost a straight line. Okay. It's a very flexible function. It still doesn't solve the problem that the same function applies everywhere. Yeah, so if I go from steel to cast iron, the same function applies. However, if I add another hyperbolic tangent here, then you can see that I get different behavior in this region to this region. So this is a second hyperbolic tangent, and in neural network terminology, I take the carbon multiplied by one coefficient, take the hyperbolic tangent, I take the carbon multiplied by another coefficient, take another hyperbolic tangent. 
by adding more and more hyperbolic tangents, I can make my function more and more complicated. Doesn't matter how complicated my problem is. Now, to illustrate that, I'll show you how simple it is to produce a complicated mathematical function. So, look over here. Oops, a little bit. two variables. Uh, the first variable is x and the second variable is y. Okay. So let's imagine we are plotting toughness as a function of the carbon concentration and the manganese concentration here. Carbon here, manganese here, toughness along the vertical axis. Okay. And four hyperbolic tangents. And I'm going to vary this coefficient n. Okay. So I'm just going to vary one coefficient n. And you will see that this function changes drastically as I vary that coefficient. That's the power of the hyperbolic tangent function, that I can make very complicated functions by altering the coefficients. Okay, so, all I'm doing is I'm varying one single number here, from something like uh, 0 to 10. Okay. Not alter altering the mathematical form, just altering the coefficient. So, what we are doing is we are producing a very flexible mathematical function which can fit a problem of any complexity. And there's no limitation to the number of hyperbolic tangents I can combine. And that's why, you know, the term neural net is a beautiful term because it's like throwing a net onto a set of data and recognizing the pattern in the data. Now, the second uh, advantage is that You know, we have large numbers of variables, okay? And we are not allowed to ignore any variables. Whereas a physicist might simplify the problem. You know, if we ignore important variables, then we will not be doing a proper calculation. And I want to illustrate to you that ignoring variables is not a good thing. Right? Now, this is a plot. This is a plot of um, y versus x, and you can see a set of points here. And that set of points doesn't make sense. It looks like a random set of points, right? And the reason why it looks like a random set of points is because we have ignored two variables. One variable is the z-axis pointing out along here, and the other one is time. And I'm going to introduce those two variables and you will see that immediately it makes sense. The data makes sense. Okay? So, oversimplifying a complicated problem is not a good thing. So I want you to watch the screen. This will be quite fast. So, at the moment we have just two variables. We have y and x. I'm going to introduce the z-axis and time. Okay? So watch the screen. And you will immediately see what this problem is. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, in, in material science, it's not a good thing to simplify the problem. Because we are dealing with real technology. And we need methods which can deal with very large numbers of variables. So, you know, we produced a model with 108 variables. Yeah. With this method, it's no problem. You can have as many variables as you like. Now, uh, okay, this is not 
not important. It's just the mathematical expression of the neural network. It's a sum of many, many hyperbolic tangents. Just like in regression analysis, you can define an error of the fit. So if this is your experimental result and this is your prediction, then the error is related to the square of the difference between those two. Okay, root mean square error. Um, now, one important problem is that, look, if I can make a very complicated function, I can make it pass through every single point. So, if you look at this graph, I'm getting perfect prediction of these results. Now, the question is, is that justified, or should I just draw a straight line through those points? I can't answer that, yeah, because I don't know the signs. Should it be a straight line, or is this the correct function? Well, this particular problem is easy to solve. Supposing I've got uh, data here, which uh, give me the time and the temperature. So the temperature is changing like this, and the time is changing like this. I divide the data set at random into two sets. The first one I call the training data set and the test data set. I only use this data set to produce the model. And I use this data set to test the model. Okay, so let me illustrate that. Now here, the black points are the points that I use to create the model. And the white points are the points that I use to test the model. Now, in this case, this model is too simple. And I have a large error with the black points. I also have a large error with the white points. Okay. So if your model is too simple, then both the training and the test error is large. Okay. If your model is too complicated, it perfectly reproduces the training data. So the training error is small. But then it badly reproduces the unseen test data. You can see this is badly predicted. And therefore the test error is large. And some optimum complexity, both the training and test error, the training error goes to a minimum. The test error goes to a minimum. So we can solve the problem that I illustrated in this slide by not using all the data to produce the model, using half the data to test the model. So there's no problem in solving that particular problem. But supposing that just give me one second. So here is a, a problem for you. Uh, I've got a set of numbers here. What is the next two numbers in that sequence? 10 and 12, right? Okay. Uh, and what you've done is you've created a model which fits the experimental data and you've extrapolated that model, right? Uh, so the next two numbers are 10 and 12. 
But look, here is another equation. If I substitute 2 into this, it exactly predicts 4. If I substitute 4, it exactly predicts 6. If I substitute 6, it exactly produces 8. If I substitute 8, it produces 8.91. Okay? So these two models exactly represent the experimental data. But they extrapolate differently. And there is no way that you can say this model is correct or this model is correct without using your metallurgy. If your metallurgy says it should be linear, then you can decide. But mathematically, they both exactly fit the experimental data, the linear model and the nonlinear model. So you need to be careful. deal with this is really important. We can have many models which fit the experimental data, but behave differently when you extrapolate. Okay. So here, for example, all three models fit the experimental data quite well, but extrapolate differently. And we need a method to express this problem. Right? And what we do is we say, okay, we must have a large error bar here and a small error bar here because all the models predict roughly the same result here but very different results here. This is a really important uncertainty that we must tell everybody when we make a prediction. If the different kinds of models are behaving differently then we need to say that look we are not sure this is a region where knowledge is uncertain. Okay. And this is not the same as an error bar, which is noise, because when you repeat the experiment, you get a different answer. This is a modeling uncertainty. Okay. And just to show you, you can see the error bar here is different from the error bar here. And that's saying, look, I'm doing a calculation here, but I'm not really happy with it because if I use a different model, I will get a different answer. So with a non-linear model, you need to take particular care about extrapolation. And you have to use your physics or your metallurgy to decide whether, even though the uncertainty is large here, is this the correct result? And it may very well be the correct result because look, whenever we are doing new alloys, this uncertainty will always be large. Okay? You can see the uncertainty is very large, but nevertheless, the experimental data are correctly predicted. But it's given you a warning that, look, be careful. Okay. So there are two kinds of error bars. One is when you repeat an experiment, you get a different answer. And that's called noise. It's because some variable is not controlled. The second kind of uncertainty, which is very important for this method is that different models might predict different answers. So the error bar is not constant. It will vary with where you do the calculation. Now, we have described every possible type of model. Okay? Uh, we've described you know, first principles, electron theory, thermodynamics, kinetics, and so forth, even mechanical properties, because we can deal with the most complicated mechanical properties by creating neural network models. So the question arises, do we need to do experiments anymore? Okay? Uh, so let's try and answer that question. Uh, I would say uh, yes and no. Okay? That sometimes we need to do experiments, sometimes we don't need to do experiments, but the way we decide whether we need to do experiments is as follows. That supposing you have a problem, then I would first attempt a calculation. Okay? If the calculation gives me a very good result, that means I understand what it is saying and I believe in it, then I can just do a critical experiment to test that calculation and I might immediately get a solution. If the calculation has a lot of uncertainty, 
then I might need to do a number of experiments and reach a solution. Alternatively, of course, it's possible that there is no theory. You know, if you came to me tomorrow and you said, look, uh, tell me how the creep resistance will change if I irradiate the steel. I don't have any model for that. Yeah. So I can't even begin a calculation. In that case, we, we rely on our knowledge and design a set of experiments and we may read a, reach an answer. Or you do you know, much longer term experiments, accumulate experience, and then reach an answer. And then you give all your results to a university, free of charge, okay? So that we can develop the theory. So this is a good way to proceed. Here is an example of a material which is completely different from normal steel that is used for rails and produced only by theory. Okay? So there is no experiment involved in design of this steel. Now, a normal rail steel has this kind of a structure. Do you know what this is? Perlite. Perlite. Yeah? So, uh, if I asked you to describe, Hansen, the structure, how would you describe it? Cementite, layers of cementite and layers of ferrite, right? Alternating plates. But it is misleading. The true structure is like this. Okay? Think of the cementite as the leaves of a cabbage. Yeah, they are all connected in three dimensions. So it's a single crystal of cementite. And you put that cabbage in a bucket of water. Then the water is the single crystal of ferrite. And when I cut the cabbage, I see alternating layers of cementite, ferrite, cementite, ferrite. But in three dimensions, it's a bicrystal of cementite and ferrite. Now, the strength, of course, increases when I decrease the spacing. But the toughness does not, because the size of the colony determines the facet for fracture. So, for many years, you know, we have increased the wear resistance of rail steels, but not the toughness. These rails are produced with a completely different microstructure. They have no cementite. Okay. They are basically plates of bainitic ferrite and retained austenite. And they have remarkable rolling contact fatigue resistance. So this is, uh, you know, every time a wheel goes on top of a rail, it induces a stress under the surface. And that causes fatigue and it peels off. And you can see that uh, the new painted with steel, without any carbides, has much better rolling contact resistance than perlite and monoxide. Similarly, the wear rate on both the wheel and the rail is much, much smaller because there are no hard particles which break and cause, add to the wear problem. Okay. Whereas here you get fracture of small particles which then act like an abrasive. And this is the actual bailitic rail steel with a railway line going on top. Completely designed using theory alone. And of course then the rail was manufactured. So there are many examples where we can use algorithms to actually design, uh, design materials. So I'll finish off now by going back to this diagram. Now I think you can appreciate better that we are not dealing with physicists or chemists, but you know you need to appreciate the whole subject. It's an interdisciplinary subject, and we even have courses where we produce materials modelers instead of material scientists or physicists or chemists, and that we can go. We don't have to go linearly like this. We can go from electron theory to continuum. So, for example, we worked out the carbon-carbon interaction energy using electron theory, and then we are dealing with diffusion, with ignores structure. And just like we have electron microscopy contributing to every aspect of material science, 
electron microscopy or any characterization method. You can think of materials modeling crossing all the boundaries of material science. So in the case of device materials, you might be modeling electromigration. Uh, in, in metallurgy, I've given you many examples. Extraction metallurgy. Uh, you know, you're, in biomaterials, you might be designing a bone structure. Uh, molecular modeling. The materials modeling now permeates all aspects of material science, whatever it is. And the difference, this is a really important slide, I, be, I believe it's an important slide, you have to decide for yourself. I want to illustrate to you the difference between materials modeling and pure science. Okay. Both are important, but nevertheless there is a clear difference. So, supposing we start with a complicated problem. The pure scientist will simplify it until he can develop a really rigorous mathematical theory for it. And then any experiment he will do is only validating the simple theory that he has developed. So the technology is lost in this problem. But you might get some valuable information. Modeling, on the other hand, you have the complex problem. You identify all issues in it. You assemble a whole variety of tools. And you're not worried whether the tools are empirical or very rigorous. You want the tools to solve the problem. The problem without simplification. So you combine physical and empirical methods. And when you do your calculation, you also give an estimate of uncertainty. And then you validate in two ways. The first is by doing critical experiments. But the second is by making your tools available so that other people can test them in different circumstances. Because these are complicated models, and if they work in one part of the input space, they may not work in another part. So if many people are using these tools, then they can find the problems associated with them. So this is now a very big subject, which goes through all of material science. 